Good morning, Campion Church family. How are you today? Good morning. And to all of our visitors from the West Central Young Adults, good morning to you as well. Glad that you're here with us worshiping. And for a special treat, good morning to all of our online audience because we are streaming our first service today because we are excited to have Elder Chris Holland preaching a separate message for first service and second service. Uh, if you were here uh, last night for his wonderful message, I, I hope that you're blessed by the continuing series and we are glad that you've decided to join us either in person or online. And I'm going to invite Elder Alex Rodriguez to come up and share a few words about the West Central Young Adult Ministry, and I think he's got a friend coming with him that he'll introduce you to as well. Hey, good morning and happy Sabbath. It's uh, wonderful to be, be here, and I wasn't looking backwards, and wow, it's filling up. Praise the Lord. Uh, we have a lot of things going on at Campion right now. I think, uh, Pastor, we have a, a group in uh, Costa Rica that are that are preaching down there a bunch of young people i think that are preaching as well and so that's really really exciting and so there's some of us that uh, normally would be here that are not here today but i'm excited to to be with the west central young adults and be a part of that team i want to give it to our president here in just a moment but uh, let me talk a little bit about what the program looks like today we have a full day of activities and we want to invite you to stay so right uh, right here after we get our our preliminaries done we'll, we'll ask pastor holland to come up and he'll have a, a session with us he had a session with us last night and for those of you who missed it I am so sorry it was absolutely incredible you can jump on our websites I believe and and capture what you missed but don't miss the rest of it today because I, I I'm I am completely convinced that the Lord has brought Pastor Holland here and it is so that God can change our lives so make sure that you come to the programs we have one session now we have a separate session second service and then we have um, we have two breakout sessions this afternoon one breakout session begins at 1.30, two, two different speakers, so you get, get a choice. Uh, Heidi Carpenter, I think, is, is teaching one. I'm teaching another. And then uh, breakout session number two at 2.45. Again, the two of us will continue uh, with those sessions. And then tonight at 6 p.m., the closing, uh, closing session with Pastor Holland again. So a busy, busy, busy day, but we do invite you to, to hang in there and stay with us. It's going to be exciting. But now I'm going to give it to somebody that is much more wonderful than I am, and this is our president, Mindy, and she'll tell you a little bit about West Central Young Adults. Good morning, everyone. We are excited to be with your, you here today, and I wanted to just tell you a little bit about what God's been doing through our ministry. He called us together as a group of young people who are enthusiastic about reaching our peers in whatever situation they were in. Um, we got together right at the beginning of COVID. COVID yeah. <laughs> yeah, the beginning of 2020. And it's been amazing how God has grown us as a team and also as a ministry since then, as he's made, we've been a little bit <laughs> flexible through different things. Uh, we had to do a lot of things online at the beginning, but God has been doing wonderful things. And this year it's opening up to where we're able to do a little bit more hands-on mission stuff, um, be involved with churches. We enjoy um, meeting young people where they are in their church and collaborating with them to bring training and equipping uh, them with tools for working in the church where they're at. So we really love to see how God has been working, and we want to encourage anyone who is looking for an opportunity to do missions, community outreach, anything, to come talk to any of us here on the team. Um, we'd love to collaborate with you, talk with you, and continue to grow together as leaders and reaching our peers for Christ. On behalf of the Campion Church, I just want to welcome the West Central Young Adults. I want to thank Mindy for her leadership of this ministry and to each of those who are playing a role in our service today. I want to thank them for not only being what is called the future of the church, but as you will see, they are the right now of the church. We're so grateful for the, the young people who have accepted a call of Jesus Christ to not only have a relationship with him, but to do something with it and have a relationship with Christ worth sharing. And so we're excited to hear them sing, share stories, and be encouraged by uh, not just the young, but also the young at heart, uh, Elder Holland. At this time, we'd invite you to stand as we have our invocation, our opening prayer, and remain standing for our praise anthem. Father in heaven, we just want to thank you so much for a beautiful day where we can gather together to worship you. As we take this time to draw close to you and be reminded of what it means to be living in these last times and the work that that means for us. 
Lord, I pray that this would be an inspirational, encouraging, uplifting worship service that helps us to draw closer to you and inspires us to be ready to do the work that you've called us to do. So Lord, be with us and bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Sing with us our opening hymn, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Sabbath. So this week something super, super exciting is going on, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what was happening. So just down the street about half an hour or so, yes, I'm going to hold my mic up, thank you. Just down the street about half an hour or so, there's a place called Eden Valley. Anyone ever heard of Eden Valley? All right, a few of you. Eden Valley. And we brought in a group of people. We partnered with Build and Restore International, BRI. And we brought in a group of people, and what we did is we went through, there's a building there called The Village, where a lot of uh, guests stay. We went through there, and we completely remodeled uh, six of the rooms there. Now, let me throw some facts at you. i got to have it written down, because there's no way I was going to remember it. We had 39 people there, and right now, the money worth for a volunteer hour is $29.75, which is quite a bit. That comes out to, if we do the math and how many days we worked, it comes out to be about $9,500 a day, meaning that in roughly three days, our team donated $33,000 to Eden Valley, which is absolutely incredible. Now, a school from Oregon came down, Milo Academy came down, brought a few of their students, and I've got one here that I'm going to ask some questions to. Uh, And real quick, just tell us your name. Madison Woodard. Madison. All right, and Madison, I've got a question for you. When did you leave to get here? Uh, 10 p.m. Sunday night. 10 p.m. Sunday night. And then, let me get this right. You left at 10 p.m. Sunday night, and you drove all night long, got to the airport Monday morning, and flew all Monday morning, and as soon as you got here, you got here about noon, and by 1 o'clock, your entire team was doing hard physical labor. Is that correct? Yes. (laughs) Yes, that's correct. How How many hours of sleep did you get? Uh, I got 45, some of my team got zero, and some were lucky to get three. 45 minutes? 45 minutes. So they went from 10 p.m. Sunday night all night long, flew Monday morning, and then went straight to work. That's how dedicated these young people were to fixing this place up. Is that not incredible? God is good. Uh, 
we are going to show, I believe, a video of sort of a week in review on how that went, just a short two minute video, and you can see some of the projects and what our team was able to do. Awesome. Our team was so glad to be able to get in there and help them out. Our, we are going to invite you to stand for this next song, number 326. Uh, go ahead and stand. Uh, 326, open my eyes.
incredible week singing this song. This is a brand new song that was written just for this week and this weekend. And our theme is for such a time as this. And so we're very grateful um, to Clayton, Clayton Nunes. He wrote the theme song for us this year. And it's truly Holy Spirit inspired. And so I invite those of you who know it to sing out loud and proud. And those of you who don't, um, you'll catch on soon. <laughs> it's pretty catchy. And so uh, sing with us our theme song for such a time as this. We've never been so close to see the end of sin, to hear the trumpet ring that glorious morning. But there's so much to do. For such a time as this, but we can't do it without him, right? Join us as we sing our prayer song, I Need Thee Every Hour. Great. 
If you're able to, we invite you to kneel as we pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this opportunity to be able to take time and to come before your throne. As the song just said, we need thee every hour, because we do. The breath we just took, the fact that we woke up this morning, everything that we have and everything that we are is because of you. You are God, the King of kings, Lord of hosts. You are in control and on the throne. Help us to trust you more. Help us to know that you are in control, even when life isn't always blue skies and butterflies. Lord, as we get together here and sing praises and celebrate, for some of us, this has been a great week, a high week, a relaxing week. Opportunities to celebrate and rejoice abounded. And so we gather here with joy in our hearts, appreciating the fact that spring is here and and so much more. But for some of us, this has been a hard week. We know that there are still crises happening around the world. and We know that there are crises even happening here on our campus. For some of us, this has been a long, hard, life-changing week with some of the news that we've received. But help us to remember that you are in control that even if you say no to everything that we pray about, that you are still our God. And help us to trust in you, to find hope in you, to find strength in you, because there is no other place that we can turn, no other hope in this world, especially as we see the time drawing near. Lord, help us to cling to you more fully, As the skies darken, as the world darkens, as turmoil and strife and sin abound, help us to turn our eyes upon you, and the brightness of your glory will make those things just fade away. And so, Lord, today, as we gather for worship, may the worship be about and for your glory. Lord, I pray that you'd be with us as we continue in this service, in this day, in this journey of life. May everything we do celebrate you. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. this time, I'm going to ask all the children to come up for the children's story um, that Amelia has prepared for you all.
Well, good morning, boys and girls. I just want to take a second here and welcome you here while Amelia catches her breath from running down from doing music. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for doing our story today. Well, good morning, boys and girls. I have a question for you. How many of you have ever seen an eagle? You've seen an eagle. You've seen it. Wow. Okay. Okay. We have a lot of hawks here in Colorado, but I've seen a couple eagles too. And they are really big and impressive birds. Well, the story that I'd like to tell you today is about an eagle. You can lower your hands if you haven't already. <laughs> it is about two eagles, not just one. It's about two eagles. One of those eagles was flying high in the sky. If I was an eagle, I would really like that because I'd like to be able to fly. But this eagle was flying high in the sky. And another eagle was flying too. And this eagle looked at the other eagle and said, oh, he's flying higher than me. And he started to get jealous. And so as he watched this eagle flying high in the sky, higher than him, he noticed something else. As he looked down from his eagle's eye view, he saw a hunter with a bow and arrow hunting. So he said, hmm, and he flew down to the hunter. And he told the hunter, Look at that eagle flying up there so high. Wouldn't you like to shoot him? And the hunter said, I would, but he's so high. I think I need an extra feather for my arrow. I need one from you. And so the eagle said, oh, certainly. So he plucked out one of his feathers, and gave it to the hunter. The hunter put it on his arrow, pulled back his bow, creak, pow, it missed. Not quite high enough. The hunter said, I'm going to need another feather. So the eagle said, OK, just two feathers, right? He plucked out his next feather, gave it to the hunter, pulled the arrow back, and went pew, and missed. He said, I'm going to need a lot more feathers than that. And so the hunter kept shooting, and the eagle kept giving him feathers. And the hunter kept shooting and shooting and shooting and kept missing and missing and missing. And he said, I need one more feather. And the eagle, so still so angry at the other eagle flying higher than him, realized he had no feathers left. The hunter turned and realized that he had some very easy prey. Now, this story reminds me of a text in the Bible in Proverbs 16, verse 18, that tells us that we should not be proud. And there's somebody else in the Bible who was proud, and that was Haman. Haman was so proud, he got angry when Mordecai would not bow down to him, so that he wanted to destroy Mordecai. Who knows what happened to Haman in the Bible? What happened to Haman? He got hanged. He got hanged, yes. So in Proverbs 16, verse 18, it says, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Another Bible text that I like is in 2 Samuel, and it says that the Lord exalts those who are humble. So we can learn two things from this, from the eagle and from Haman. Not to be proud, uh, not to be proud of ourselves, and not to envy others as well. And also to remember that the Lord rewards, Jesus will reward you if you are humble and if you are seeking after him. So remember the eagle. If you see another eagle, remember that story of the eagle flying high and be content with where you're flying in life. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for this day. I pray that you would help us not to be proud. And I thank you, Lord, for promising that you will help us if we are humble. I ask that you would bless the rest of this service and the rest of the Sabbath day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Amen. How many of you have heard the phrase, it's all Greek to me? Well, if it's all Greek to you, then you have never had the chance to sit in a Greek class taught by Pre Pastor Chris Holland. I have. <laughs> Because apparently in his final year of seminary studies, as he worked on his master's degree, he had, he had all sorts of free time, including being able to come over and teach the undergrad students Greek. Second semester, in beginner Greek. And I had the chance for a semester to sit and to listen to the uh, insight into that unique language that uh, God given to uh, Dr. Holland as he went back later to receive his doctorate. Uh, I am excited to be able to see him once again, to be able to learn from him once again, and I hope that you're blessed too. Uh, since that time, by the way, he has served the World Church in many capacities, according to his LinkedIn profile. He's basically served every level of the denomination at some point. He's an international speaker, an evangelist, a man of God, and we are excited to have him here today. Please give me a hearty amen and welcome to Pastor Chris Holland. Well, thank you, Pastor Michael. It is a uh, wonderful thing to be here. I am both honored and privileged that the West Central Young Adults have asked me to be here with you all this weekend. I'm also honored and privileged because not only did I have the opportunity to be the teacher of Pastor Michael Taylor, Pastor Michael Getz is one of my good friends, and uh, I am honored to be able to speak from his pulpit. You know, uh, Pastor Taylor was talking about my teaching of Greek, and that uh, goes along with the theme of the weekend for such a time as this. I'll not forget, I was teaching in the undergraduate while doing my master's degree for the honors class, which was called Western Heritage, which is a combination of, of history, religion, and the arts all in one class with different teachers, and Ranko Stefanovic, who was the interim chair at that time, called me into his office and asked me this question. So how's your Greek? Oh, it's pretty good. He says, good, because you're going to be teaching second semester Greek, and I said, I don't know if it's that good, uh, and that was for such a time as this, and my goal during that semester was basically to stay one, ahead, one day ahead of the students so they at least thought I knew what I was talking about. Well, praise the Lord for that, Pastor Michael. Praise the Lord for that. As we spend some time together studying the Scriptures, I would invite you to be in prayerful meditation that God would reveal a message for each of us here this morning. It is an amazing thing how the Holy Spirit works when we read the Bible that He is able to touch our heart. And my goal this morning is not just to fill your mind with information, but that we might practically apply the Scriptures. Because the practical application of the Scriptures is why God provided them. So let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we have gathered here for worship. Central to that worship is your Son, Jesus. And as we now open the written Word, we pray that the, in, that the One who is the incarnate Word would be revealed to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to go back in time further than last night. Last night we spent our time in the book of Esther. Today, this morning, for this first service, we will go back in time further to the time of Daniel. When we think of Daniel, we need to understand Daniel's ministry in the context of the words from Esther that were spoken by Mordecai, and that is, for such a time as this. The Bible doesn't give us a lot of background to what Daniel's life was like before 605 BC. I would imagine his life was fairly normal, like most other late teen, early 20 individuals. But in 605 BC, everything changed just like that. Nebuchadnezzar invaded Jerusalem. 
and took the cream of the crop, so to speak, from Jerusalem back to the kingdom. It was how the Babylonians operated. You take the nobility, train them in Babylonian ways, and then utilize those individuals to govern the people that you have just conquered. I want you to think for a moment of Daniel for such a time as this. But the calling of God is not always easy. The calling of God is not always roses. The calling of God does not always mean that life will go just like we want it. Because Daniel was removed first from his home. Then Daniel had an attempt to remove from him his food. Daniel started a new school. The Babylonians went so far as to give Daniel a new name. And the Bible says that he and his friends were made eunuchs, which means that they were no longer able to have children. Daniel was, of course, familiar with the prophecy of Jeremiah, knowing that this this capture and rule by a foreign empire wasn't going to be short. He knew that it would be at least 70 years. Yet the testimony of the book of Daniel is clear because it begins in chapter 1 with it saying, Daniel purposed in his heart. Daniel purposed in his heart and it is related to the message that we had together last night. Daniel purposed in his heart to be faithful in the smallest of things so that when the time came, he would be faithful in the largest of things. You know the book of Daniel well, I am sure. Daniel chapter 2, of course, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. Nebuchadnezzar doesn't know the dream. Nebuchadnezzar doesn't understand the dream. And Daniel is called upon by God for such a time as this to reveal to Nebuchadnezzar the dream and its interpretation. What we often skip over is the spiritual application. We're well familiar with the head of gold and the chest and arms of silver, the midsection of brass or bronze, the legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay, and the stone cut without hands, but we are often skipping over the spiritual application because I want you to think of Daniel. Daniel was placed in a very advantageous position, wasn't he? He knew something that the king wanted to know, but the king did not have. What we do not find is we do not find Daniel making a bargain. Think of this. He is a foreigner. And while he is at the top of his class, graduating from the University of Babylon, so to speak, he has something the king wants, but the king does not have. In our political world today, there would then be bargaining made. Well, you see, King, let me, let's, let's review this. You want to know, you don't know, but I know, and I can tell you, so why don't we do this? Why don't you guarantee me a position in the government, guarantee my three friends a good home, and then I'll tell you. But that's not what we find from Daniel. No, Daniel appears before the, before the king, and he basically says, listen, it's not me that can tell you this, but there is a God in heaven who can tell you the answer to these problems. And God blesses Daniel. And then, of course, Daniel chapter 3 and Daniel's three friends who will not bow before the king. Daniel chapter 4. And again, I want you to imagine Daniel and Daniel chapter 4 has been given a dream about what is going to happen to Nebuchadnezzar. And he, a foreigner, has to appear before the king and say, listen, I've got a message for you from God. You're arrogant and God's going to bring your kingdom to an end. That usually doesn't bode well for your survival in the Babylonian kingdom. Yet Daniel was faithful. Of course, in Daniel chapter 5, as there was partying and the Medo-Persians were closing in upon Babylon, 
Daniel was faithful to give the message. The Medo-Persians arrived and Daniel once again was faithful to give the message. Now he survived a new ruling kingdom and he was faithful. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel is once again given a dream that outlines the history of the world before it was history. And that brings us to Daniel chapter 8 where I want us to spend just a few moments. Daniel is given a dream, and as he is given a dream, you'll remember in the dream he sees a ram and a goat, and that ram and that goat represent the Medo-Persian Empire, the goat, of course, representing the Greeks, the Greek Empire, and the Greeks conquering Medo-Persia, that then that prophecy continues to include the rise of Rome, the, the, the changing of Rome from a pagan Rome to papal Rome, But then Daniel is given a portion of the dream in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. The Bible says that Daniel does not understand the dream. The angel comes and makes the dream plain to him except one portion. In verse 23 of Daniel chapter 8, the angel explains the context to Daniel to help him understand. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise having fierce features who understands sinister schemes. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. Through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule, and he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without human means." And the vision of the evening and mornings which was told is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. Daniel is given a dream. He is given a dream which is a recapitulation of earlier dreams. Recapitulation is merely a term that means the repeating and enlarging. The foundational prophecy of Daniel chapter 2 is the image, the history of the world when it was still the future. Daniel chapter 7 repeats that and fills in some of the details. Daniel chapter 8 repeats that and fills in more details. Daniel chapter 11 repeats that and fills in even more details. The outline is a very simple outline. There were nations, there is a judgment, and then the second coming. Nations, judgment, and the second coming. Some will question as they study Daniel chapter 8, and this is not the main concern of my sermon here this morning. Why is Babylon not in Daniel chapter 8? It is because Daniel chapter 8 does not come chronologically Babylon was about to be, to be defeated and was no longer of concern in the future. But the angel says to Daniel, look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the latter time. And it is not merely the latter time, but the Bible says that it is the latter time of indignation. In verse 19, and he said, Look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of the indignation, for at the appointed time the end shall be. First, let us understand what is the latter time. The latter time is a time, or a word rather, the word latter, is actually the same word used 
in the theme text for your church. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, thoughts of peace and not of evil. And then it says to give you a future and a hope. The word there, future, is the identical Hebrew word used by Daniel when he speaks of the latter time. You see, the angel was giving to Daniel a specific prophecy that was of the future, the future end that would happen. The hope that Jeremiah referenced and that he references in this text of Jeremiah 29, 11 is the only hope for our society. It is the hope in the second coming of Jesus Christ. We can see very clearly that humanity is very good at messing things up. But unfortunately, during these times, God's people have trusted in political rulers to solve the problems of the day. And I'm not making a political statement. I don't care whether you're a Democrat, a Republican, a Libertarian, or an Independent of some kind. There is no political leader that will bring an end of the suffering that we are now experiencing. There is only one end that will bring hope to all of us, and that is the second coming of Jesus Christ, which Daniel, which Daniel describes as the appointed time. You see, Daniel knew, and the angel was communicating to Daniel that there was only one hope, and that hope is in the return of Jesus Christ. But that return of Jesus Christ is preceded by what is called the latter time of indignation. What is indignation? The word indignation is a reference to God's outrage against sin. There is a difference between indignation and wrath. Indignation is how God feels about sin. And we know how God feels about sin. He is outraged by sin. God hates sin. And what will he do with sin, in particular unforgiven sin? Well, his wrath is what deals with unforgiven sin. God is outraged by sin. He was outraged by the fall of Lucifer. He was broken by the fall of Lucifer. His heart ached over the fall of Lucifer, but he is outraged by what sin has done to his creation. And I will tell you, I must wonder aloud this morning, if one of the reasons that we are still on this earth is if many of us really understand what sin is. Too often we look upon sin as simply a, oops, I made a mistake. But sin is outrageous to God. Sin killed the Son of God. Sin is serious. The sin of humanity on this earth transformed the course of history of this earth. And God is outraged by what it has done. Yet this then brings a question, why hasn't God then done something about it? In the midst of coronavirus, many have been left wondering, if God is so outraged by the pain and suffering, why doesn't he just come? Some wonder, where is God? Some wonder where is God when you are in the midst of a cancer diagnosis. Let us not be mistaken. God is outraged by sin and its effects. And his wrath will deal with sin at the appointed time. But more important than God's wrath existing is that wherever God's wrath exists, so does His justice and His mercy. 
2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. How many does God desire to come to repentance? All. How many is all? Everyone. Now, do we know that there will be people that make a decision to not be a part of God's kingdom? Of course. We know that the Bible is clear. But let us know that God's intention is that everyone would be saved. But God's heart is outraged by sin as he is. He's even more outraged by the reality that John 14 promises, John 14 promises that God's son right now is preparing a place. And who is he preparing that place for? I'm glad I saw somebody back there say us. That's far more personal because you see when Jesus says, by the way, the context of Jesus saying those words just so we understand. When the Bible was originally written, it was not written with chapter and verse division. In fact, the joke among scholars is the man who did the chapter and verse division was riding on a very bumpy road in his horse cart and at random is when he put those chapter and verse divisions in there. By the way, I'm not opposed to the chapter and verse division because it helps us find the verses much easier. But I would encourage you, by the way, as a side note, there are some Bibles that are called the Reader's Bible, and they don't have the chapters and the verses in there. It is an interesting reading because then we don't artificially stop. But what precedes those words of Jesus, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. What precedes that? Of course, the obvious answer is, is John chapter 13. What happens at the end of John chapter 13? You'll remember this is when Peter, Peter says to Jesus, I will die for you. And what did Peter say to, excuse me, what did Jesus say to Peter? Will you? Assuredly, I say unto you, before the crock crows, you will deny me. Not once, not twice, three times. I want you to imagine how heartbroken Peter was to hear those words. And what's the very next words out of the mouth of Jesus? Let not your heart be troubled. You see, Jesus understands that we will disappoint him at moments in history, but our heart should not be troubled because Jesus is preparing a place for us. And God is outraged by the reality. God has indignation toward the reality that Jesus is preparing that place and there are people who don't care. He wants you to be there. My dear young people, and there are many of you here today, God wants you in heaven. God wants to spend eternity with you. To all of us. He wants you there. He wants your son there, your daughter, your brother, your sister, your mom, your dad. All of us. But God needs to deal with the sin problem because what he does not want about and he does not want in this universe is sin. He must deal with the sin problem. And Daniel is promised that at the latter time of indignation, God will deal with sin at the appointed time in which Jesus returns. And at that appointed time, God's indignation will be realized through his wrath. And his wrath will bring an end to sin. And the Bible describes the ending of sin in the book of Isaiah as God's strange act. Because in that act, his wrath will be unleashed. And let us be clear that that wrath was never intended to deal with human beings. Matthew chapter 25, speaking of hellfire, makes it clear. Hellfire was the creation. 
to deal with the devil and his angels. It was never intended for humanity. It is called God's strange act because the creator must bring an end to lives. His wrath was never intended for his creation. But God in his mercy must deal with this by bringing an end to those who love themselves and their sins so much that they are unwilling to give it up. Yet a great irony of Scripture is the latter days of indignation which will bring about an end also usher in a new beginning. Daniel chapter 12 describes that time. Daniel chapter 12 says at that time. What time is that time? Daniel 11.40 says, the appointed time. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time, excuse me, there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. This is a description when Jesus comes again. It is at the appointed time where Jesus is able to stand. And when Jesus stands, the question is, will he be standing for you? That decision is a decision that you must make. We talked about this last night, young people. At an appointed time, when the latter day of indignation where God's outrage against sin will be worked out through his wrath and the outrage of his sin will excuse me the outrage against sin will be on display to eliminate sin forever yet his mercy reigns supreme because the bible says that after that one pulse of harmony will beat throughout the universe as outlined in the book great controversy And the great promise that we have here is that God wants us all to be a part of that new place, that perfect place. And you know, when I even mention that most for most of us, it's hard to imagine what a perfect place is. There's very little in this life that is perfect. Have you ever done a job, maybe you've painted a room, And as you painted it, you looked at it and you said, wow, this is good. And then you take a step back and there's that spot right over there that you missed. There will be no spot missed in heaven. Heaven will be perfect. Our bodies will be perfect. Our bodies will function the way they are intended to function. I don't know about any of you out there, but I actually suffer from an autoimmune disease, which is the epitome of what sin does to us. It makes your immune system attack yourself. That won't happen in heaven. Everything will be perfect. We will never have to say goodbye. You see, on Sunday, I'm enjoying my time with all of you, but on Sunday, I will say goodbye. When I left my home in Virginia on Thursday, I had to say goodbye, but in heaven we will never have to say goodbye. No, in heaven we can always say, see you later. We can't always say, see you later here because we do not know. I had not intended on sharing this, but I will share this to you, with you. You see, because here's the point. God is preparing a place right now for you to be there. And Jesus tells us quite simply how we can be prepared. Watch and pray. He wants you there. Watch and pray and prepare. 
And so I want to share a brief story with you that happened to me just two weeks ago. My wife and I had been working at the School of Evangelism there in Haymarket, Virginia. We had had a long day, and we had not eaten, and so, and I know it was an unhealthy choice, but we went to Five Guys to get some fries. Do you guys have Five Guys out here? Yes? Okay, good. I mean, is there anything better in the world than a potato, especially when it's fried in oil? But anyways... That's not the point of the story. This Five Guys was in in, in an area where there were like a strip of stores and then on the other side of the road, another strip of stores, like a little side road. And I went and, and as is usually the case, I went and I parked the car in the parking spot and then I went inside. And I left my wife in the car with the car running. And as I went to the counter to order my fries, there were some very interesting things that happened. The cashier said, okay, we've got you all set as I ordered the fries. Wait, we've got you. And then he walked away. I said, well, normally in this world, you have to pay for these things. Uh, But then it became evident he was just going to give me these fries, which was awfully nice of him. And then he did something that was fascinating. Because while this is happening, there's something else happening that I have nothing, I have no knowledge of. He says to me, do you want a drink? I really didn't want a drink. He said, I, I said, no, no, that's okay. He says, no, 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 really, do you want a drink? I said, no, 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 it's, it's okay. He says, no, you need a drink. And he gave me a cup. I said, okay, I'll take your drink. And so then I walked over to the drink machine, which you now need like a PhD to try to figure out how to make these things work. You know, uh, you need to be like an IT specialist to figure this all out. And by the way, for those of you, I I made a very good choice. I got sparkling water. I didn't get soda, I got sparkling water to help wash down my fried fries. But while all this is going on, I. I have no idea what's happening outside. While I'm inside, my wife is sitting in the car. And have you ever been sitting in a car and you have that sense like you're moving because it's the car next to you that's actually moving? You ever had that happen to you? So that's what happened to my wife. But the problem was is there was no car next to her. It was our car that was moving. And of course, my wife panicked because she did not know what to do. And so she got out of the car. And the car continued moving. But then something very interesting happened. So she went around to the driver's side because she was going to jump in the car and try to stop the car. And here's where the story gets very interesting the car began to accelerate on its own. And thankfully, under the, I believe, moving of the Holy Spirit, my wife did not jump in the car. And the car continued to accelerate faster and faster. And the car does a big semicircle. And the car at this point has gained so much speed that the car jumped a 15 or 16 inch square curb, knocked an iron bench that was bolted to the cement along with an iron garbage can bolted to the cement, knocked those off and continued and proceeded to then hit the building, which happened to be glass and broke the window. I came out and of course I was a little uh, disturbed because the car's not there. And I said, what has happened? At first I said, well, maybe, you know, maybe my wife went to go grab something real quick and came back. Uh, you know, I, I mean, you have a lot of fleeting thoughts. You know, um, and then I look and I see the car. And, it, and there was a little street right there and I was like, why is the car parked down there? And then I was like, Wait a second, while this is, and this is all split second, I see my wife holding her head. 
And I see that the car's not in a parking spot, but the car is parked itself up against the building. And so, of course, I go running over there. I reach into the car, I turn the car off. The car's in park. The car's in park. Let me tell you how God works when we talk about for such a time as this and the appointed time. You remember I told you, some of you are wondering, why is he making a big deal about the free drink? Had I not been given that free drink and had to go to that drink machine that requires an IT specialist to figure out, I would have been outside when this started to happen. And for the men in the room, you know what we would have done because we're men. And men, we fix things. And we're superheroes. And what makes it even more is I've been taking exercise a little more seriously, so I've been, I've been pumping some weight. So, you know, you've got some testosterone flowing. And so for whatever reason, we think we're invisible, and I would have tried to jump in that car. And I need to tell you, 20 years ago, I had a friend who worked at 3ABN who was working on his car, and his car came out of gear and pinned him up against a wall, and he killed him. And I have no question that that night the devil was trying to take my wife and I out because we have gone back to that place. And I said, maybe the car slipped into reverse. So I pulled into the same spot at the same time and I put the car in reverse and I took my foot off the brake. And I sat there for 10 minutes and the car never moved because that parking spot is on an incline, which when you're parking is on a decline. And the reason I'm telling you this, my dear young people, is life is precious and you don't know if you've got tomorrow. It's not guaranteed. I went for for some french fries and instead my car got wrecked, but it could have been worse. There were no people there, there were no cars there, and my wife got out of the car. And by the way, then I started hitting the gas with my car trying to replicate this little maneuver that my car made on its own, I could never replicate it, not once. I'm very careful in applying spiritual things, but friends, we are living in a world where the battle is not seen. And what is the point that I'm making when we talk about the appointed time? Jesus has an appointed time where he's coming and he's going to make all things that are wrong right. And the greatest desire of Jesus Christ is that you would be a part of his kingdom which will last forever. And forever is forever. And that's hard to describe because we live in a world where nothing is forever. Even the things that they say are forever are not forever. But his kingdom will last forever. It will have no end. It will be perfection. And the testimony of the Bible is clear that Jesus is doing everything he can to make sure you're there. And my question this morning is very simple. Are you doing everything you can to make sure you're there? Watch, pray, and prepare. And I will challenge you with the similar challenge that I challenged you with last night. What is it in your life that stands as an impediment between you and Jesus and his kingdom? You come to the 11 o'clock service and I will outline the call of God is very simple. In these perilous times, he calls us to throw those things out. How do we do that? You come to second service and I'll tell you. But for now, are you willing to make the decision? Jesus is doing everything he can to rescue the perishing. And that's a song we're going to sing as we close today. I'll invite our song team up. Rescue the perishing. And as we sing that song, don't just apply it to everybody out there. Jesus is doing everything to rescue the perishing, which includes me. And let us make a decision to follow him today.
Let's sing together and stand together and sing Rescue the Perishing. Jesus will save and he'll save me and he'll save you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you sent your son Jesus to make the provision for our salvation. And now today we make a decision. We want to be ready for the appointed time in which Jesus will return. And so Lord, today we make the decision to give our lives fully to Jesus Christ, to watch, pray, and prepare that we would be ready for him when he comes again. We 